Hi, folks. Where were we? Well, uh, one announcement, which is, and you don't need this now. Whew, just got back. Um, homework two is out, so and it will probably be due in two weeks. Um, then we'll, uh, let's see. I'll tell you at the end. Remind me. Sorry, no late homework. And what I will ask. Go ahead and have a seat. Is that once I start lecturing, there shouldn't, you know, except for the last time when I passed out the actual lecture notes. Uh, try not to go into this. You know. Anyway, so where were we? We were talking about equilibrium. And whew, we had talked about what the equilibrium constant was. We said that the equilibrium constant was the um, ratio of products raised to coefficients divided by reactants raised to coefficients, and those were concentrations. And uh, let's go through the phases that we know, and if you can uh, tell me which ones do appear in uh, KC or KP expressions, do uh, gases appear? Yes, two aqueous phases appear in KC. What about solids? No. What about liquids? No. And where we had uh, then left off was we were starting to manipulate equilibrium constant expressions. And uh, we left off on page 9. We said that if you switch the reactants and products, or you flip, or you reverse, whatever term you use, it's the reciprocal of the K value. Okay. Any questions before we move on to new material? Okay. Uh, then we'll move on here. It says, what is the KC value for? I will separate it from the previous KCs by calling this KC2. So I'll add a subscript there. KC2 value for the one uh, reaction printed here. I will emphasize that K values, each reaction has a different K value, just like each reaction. I know these are very closely related reactions, but any changes makes them different. Uh, all right. Whenever we have a reaction, we can write out a KC, or an equilibrium constant expression. It's going to be products, concentrations raised to their uh, coefficient, divided by reactant concentrations. Oop. Solid does not get put in. And we're asking what is the value for? We are uh, referring to in relation to the value that you've already been given. KC expression here. Will just be squared because we've multiplied the coefficients times two. Therefore, we square the K value for this reaction. And while we're here, KC refers to the KC value on page 9 right here. We square this, we get 4.4 times 10 to the 94. Wow, that's a large number. My calculator almost couldn't handle that. But it could. Any questions about that? So, uh, and I'll give you the rule, rule. Double the coefficients, square the K value. Square the K value. And I've written it just as K. Remember, everything with equilibrium constants is big K. So everything's a capital K this time. And so far we've seen KC and KP, true. We'll also see other Ks as we come up. So, and it is always true. Now this time I'm going to give you the rule first. Rule, if you add two or more 
reactions to obtain an overall reaction multiply the corresponding equilibrium constants. Now I'll give you the example. In this example, we're going to take carbon monoxide gas plus three moles of hydrogen gas. We'll use our equilibrium arrows to make methane gas and H2O gas. At this point, I'll uh, point out to you that you'll notice that all of the KC values have been given to you. Question, Marissa? In this example? Okay. Uh, <coughs> I was relating it to this one that we did uh, last lecture, and uh, the KC expression for this KC for this would be CO, concentration of CO squared, over concentration of O2, like so. And this expression here is the square of that. Will that help out? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions about that? Yeah, Mackenzie. Yes. So, whereas we went from 2, 1, 2 to 4, 2, 4, yes. Double the coefficients. Dylan, and then Logan? So, if we triple the coefficients, it'd just be cubed? If we triple them, they'll be cubed, yeah. If we have them, they'll be square rooted. Yeah. Although, typically, the most popular thing to do is multiply by 2. Although, I guess I can, I can see. So, um, if you remember Hess's law, we did do some halving of coefficients last semester. And so basically all of the same manipulations, two reactions that we did for Hess's law last semester, or whenever you had it, can be hungry, we will do with equilibrium constants as well, because we'll be interested in understanding the same phenomenon. Did that answer your question, Logan, or do you have a same question? Yeah. Cool. All right, so then we'll get back to this one. If you had two or more reactions to obtain an overall reaction, multiply the corresponding equilibrium constants. What I was saying was that you'll notice that I've been giving you all of the KC values. That always has to be true. Just like we gave you delta H values when we did uh, first semester general chemistry, we will give you KC. Every once in a while, we'll figure out a way to determine a KC like this, but I'll still have to give you two KC values before you'll put them together, do math, and find a new KC value. Hmm? We'll see. All right. I'm going to call this one KC1. It turns out to be 3.92. Then if we take methane in the gas phase, react it with two moles of hydrogen sulfide. To make carbon disulfide. And that will be plus H2 gas. Kc for this one, which we'll call Kc2, is 3.3 .3 times 10 to the fourth. And just like we did with Hess's law, if something is on both sides, you may cancel it out. I see a CH4. 
on both sides. What else do we have? We have one H2, leaving us with two H2s on the other side. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot something. I forgot a four right there. And that makes things cancel a little differently. So that'll make all three of those H2s and three of the H2s on the other side. Anyway, add up uh, and look what, what's left. We have two reactants, we have three products. AC3 will be the product of the KC1 times KC2. It'll be 1.3 times 10 to the 3. Whereas for last semester for delta H values, you could still do all of this with the adding reactions, and you would add the delta H values this time or multiply. Okay. Any questions about that? Now let's talk about what does the value of K mean? values of K, and we'll start with values of K close to 1. I'll leave that up there, hopefully we can still see this. These are uh, large K, or sorry, uh, KCs, KPs, whatever equilibrium constants we will see. And as an example of a value of K close to 1, I'm just going to write this top reaction over on the right hand side. So it doesn't get too much closer to 1, 3.92, uh, especially compared to some of the values we've seen. We've seen equilibrium constants all the way out to powers of 10 to the plus 94 already, and all the way down to 10 to the minus 48. And so, first thing I'll say is, equilibrium constant values, the numbers, can take on any value. We have no preconceived notions about our equilibrium constant values. This one, well, let me write out the KC expression. KC is going to equal products over reactants. And if the value of K is close to one, all that means is that the concentrations of the products and the concentrations of the reactants are approximately equal. concentration of products and reactants are approximately equal. And what do I mean by that? Well, one could be 10 or sometimes even 100 times greater than the other one for products and reactants, but it won't be a factor of a million times greater. A 
Another way of describing this is, as we'll see, if in CAMP 400 every reaction went all the way towards products or to completion, this is a reaction that goes part of the way. This reaction gets stuck in the middle because there are some reactants and some products at the end of when the reaction reaches equilibrium. So a reaction goes, a reaction gets stuck in the middle. at equilibrium. And I'll add there are significant concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium. I'm using cons period to abbreviate concentrations. There are significant concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium. Question, Travis? So the KC value is just pretty much a proportion of how much there is of each one. And so you're saying it's closer to KC1 or one value. It's pretty much always going to stop in the middle. But if it's a high value, it would go way more in favor of uh, reactants. Well, let's talk about it. <clears throat> let's leave that one up there. Now let's talk about large values of K. And we'll do it for the same reaction we've got right here. If K is very large, which will have higher concentrations, the products or the reactants? Products will. So large values of K, large concentrations of products, or <clears throat> let me put it slightly differently. Or let me say, say the same thing in a different way. At equilibrium, the concentration of products is much greater, and I'm going to use two greater than signs to indicate much greater, much greater than concentration of reactants. And much greater, that's a qualitative statement that doesn't have numbers with it right now. We'll put some numbers to it in a minute. You'll see that the relative concentrations do depend on the exponents here. So we're coming up with trends right now. And what I would say is that in general, K, and that's KC, KP, K sub whatever, greater than 10,000, that's big. That means you're going to have a lot more products than reactants. Although again, it will depend on what the coefficients are. But if you see a K that's greater than 10,000, that's what I consider large. Okay? And you can assume that at equilibrium you have a lot more products. And in fact, you can assume another way of saying this, uh, well, let's finish this thought, is large. 10,000 is large. And when this is true, another way of describing the reaction is the reaction goes to completion. There are not significant amounts of reactants left. Reaction goes to completion, and I put goes to complete or to completion in quotes there because there is on some level in every reaction now that we're talking about in Chem 401 some reactants left over. Even for that reaction where the K value was 10 to the plus 94, 
on some level, that reaction has not gone 100% to completion. Sure, it went 99.999999999%. Roughly, I don't know. I may have, I have about the right number. Anyway, so to completion, no reaction goes truly to completion now that we understand the equilibrium process. Any questions about that? Okay. Question, Marissa. So question about, so how these relate to when the reaction happens? So like if a reaction like goes past the equilibrium point, then like would it no longer have like a phase value because it's no longer able to go in reverse anymore? So your question is about when a reaction goes past its equilibrium points. And I'll say a couple things about that. One is all reactions, it will turn out, only go towards equilibrium because equilibrium is the lowest energy point and it is the same thing as if this pen will go to its lowest energy state, it will stay there. And, um, and so it won't go back and forth. It'll just go towards it. Uh, okay. And so if the question is, and we're going to deal with this, if you start with reactants, Will it get to equilibrium? Yes, and you'll get this K value. If we started with pure products, it'll still get to this value. It'll just, if you start with reactants, it'll do the forward reaction until you get to equilibrium. If you, do the, if you start with all products, it'll do the reverse reaction to get to equilibrium. So it approaches it from either direction. I don't know if that answered the question. All roads lead to equilibrium for these reactions wherever you start. And we'll do that. And we've had a few numbers up here, but we were, we, like where we're going is we're going to solve these to find out what the concentrations are at equilibrium. But we're getting a feel for this equilibrium constant thing first. So another question or? Okay. All right. So when K is very large, you may assume the reaction will go to completion understanding that no reaction truly goes to completion. But we'll still assume that it does. Uh, small values of K, well, uh, we'll make similar statements. At equilibrium, reactant concentrations are much greater than products. In general, and we're going to define 10 to the minus fourth this time as when k is less than that value. So they're identical criteria, at least as far as their distance from the value of 1. This is small. And a lot of quotes here. It's write more numbers. All right. Oh, and so the effective statement is the reaction does not go because you have all reactants pretty much. Reaction does not go. And we'll see that sometimes. Okay. Now we'll have additional, additional things to say about this, but these are our three loosely based criteria if you want to know for how far a reaction goes towards products. Now let's talk about something called the reaction quotient, QC. QC is used to predict the direction of reaction, forward or reverse, as the reaction approaches equilibrium. QC has the same expression as KC, except not at equilibrium. When given a set of initial conditions, plug into the QC expression to see how to get to equilibrium. 
Uh, let me say a few things about that, and then we will actually start solving some problems. One, Q sub C is the same expression as KC. And the only difference is that QC, you're plugging in concentrations that are not at equilibrium. And uh, I'm going to write that, plugging in concentrations not at equilibrium, so you'll know when you use this. It says plugging, plugging in concentrations not at equilibrium. And here we'll have three expressions, uh, or three kinds of results, QC greater than KC, QC less than KC. And what we'll see is that when QC is greater than, that's a greater than sign, than KC, the reaction must go in the reverse direction to get to equilibrium. For QC less than KC, the reaction goes in forward direction to get to equilibrium. Let me say one more thing. And if QC equals KC, we are at equilibrium. Esperanza, question? What if uh, QC was a point? QC, QC or KC? What did you I'm ask me? Sorry. KC. KC. Is KC. KC is the end point. I was talking about the midpoint. It's stuck in the middle at equilibrium. Uh, okay. Well, um, so you're asking, if, so KC. What is the meaning of KC? Yeah. KC has the same expression, except that we have a number for it. And we now know that if the number is very large, that the reaction creates almost all products. If it's very small, it's all reactants. And so the reaction could stop anywhere. It could, it, like the KC value actually tells us where it stops. where it stops. And if KC is equal to one or right around one, that value tells us it's stopping about in the middle. If KC is very large, that means that the products have higher kinds, that tells us it stops at the end. And if it's very small, it stops at the beginning. QC says, depending upon how the number relates to KC, it could say, oh, KC is very large. Let's say KC is 10 million. QC is 1. That would be less than KC, so the reaction has to go and create more products. So it can't. Anyway, let me do an example. We'll see the relationship. I hope. All right. In this example, it says if Kc is 14.5 at 210 degrees Celsius for the following reaction, what direction should the reaction go to reach equilibrium if the initial, initial concentrations are all 0 0.100 mole? And so we know Kc. And this is not part of the problem, but for that value of Kc, would we expect that the reaction to go all the way to products 
stay all the way a reactance or be stuck somewhere in the middle? It's somewhere in the middle. That's what KC tells us. KC tells us how do, where is equilibrium as far as how much reaction occurs. QC tells us, okay, wherever the reaction is at when it gets to equilibrium, where are we with regards to that? So for example, so QC, still products raised to coefficients. We have one product. We have two reactants. We have a two coefficient here. And that two coefficient, of course, ends up being an exponent there. And I said all the concentrations were 0 0.1. So we plug in all the 0 0.1 zero zeros. And QC equals 100. So QC does not equal KC. We are not at equilibrium, first thing. Now we need to use these expressions over here. We see QC is greater than KC. That effectively means that the concentration of our products is larger than at equilibrium, which means we must do the reverse reaction. That will create more reactants and make this number smaller and smaller until it gets to 14.5. So QC greater than KC, reaction goes in reverse direction to get to equilibrium. Reaction. So that's what QC does. Any questions about that? Yeah, Kate. Okay. What I said was, if QC is bigger than KC, that means that the products are bigger than they need to be at equilibrium. Or, and so some of the products will be converted into reactants to get to equilibrium. What's that? Right, so the reverse reaction will turn some products back into reactants to get to equilibrium. Which is doing the reaction, the reaction goes in reverse. If KC was bigger than QC, yes, we would go and turn some of the reactants into products and do the forward reaction. Yeah, Logan. Um, so you mentioned that because of the way these ratios are set up, mm -hmm. that one of the biggest ways to get either a very large number or a very small number on top or bottom is the coefficients. Um, and so, mm -hmm. right, yes. so if you have a coefficient on the bottom, um, then you're, you're likely to have a very small number, for example. Good question, okay. Yes. Equilibrium shifts towards the products. Sorry, me, towards the, uh, I think so. I think I know what you're talking about. So what I was trying to say was, when I gave you those values of ten thousand and ten to the minus fourth, or one ten thousand, was that those are general guidelines, meaning for when you have more products, more reactants, or roughly an equal percentage. However. If you have something like a four or five uh, exponent in here, maybe it's not 10,000, maybe it's 100,000 before you have mostly products, or maybe it's 
10. Those numbers are guidelines. And what we will see after we do the um, several examples in chapter 15 that we're working right now, that in chapter 16, all the coefficients are ones. And those numbers will work very well. Those 10,000, those one 10,000. For here, all I'm trying to say is, if you want to know approximately how far a reaction goes to get to equilibrium, you can use the K value as a rough guide. But what will happen, and I think it happens in the next slide or two, is we'll actually get into the nitty gritty and calculate what the actual concentrations are at equilibrium. I don't know if that answers your question. So but I guess what I'm getting at is that those, those exponents have a very profound effect on your K value. They do, so yeah. those exponents have. They come from the coefficients of your chemical equation. Yes. And so I'm wondering how, before we learn then what makes a reaction go in a certain direction is the energy state. So things are higher energy state or lower energy state. Yes. So I'm wondering how the coefficients Good question. So your question was about how the coefficients relate to the energy state. Yeah. And the short answer is, they, so they don't. And the long answer is that when we evaluate, so first off, coefficients are just used to balance species. But if we have, but we know from Chem 400 that each of these species has what's called a delta HF value, a heat of formation. And so, each of these, and if there's two of them, then twice as much, they have an energy associated with them. And where, so the short answer is they don't. The long answer is when we get to chapter 18, we will start bringing together equilibrium constants and energy to see their relation. So there is a relation. It's not necessarily because of the twos, but the two does double the energy. Yes, it's true. Or double the delta H of formation. So we don't have, I don't have a good answer for you. Right now what we know is that K values are given to us. And eventually we will think about how they are, well, about their energies that are associated with them. Yeah, it's a good question. We just, we're not, we don't have the tools yet to deal with it. Marissa? So this is like utilitarian, like, does like both work finding and the current Yes, yeah, so, so what we, we, so far we know what KC means. We know that QC tells us which way to go to get to KC. And what we're about to do is use that information to actually solve for the equilibrium concentrations. And sometimes solve for what the KC value is. So, um, so yeah, so, so far these are just, I just arbitrarily chose 0.1. If you want a reaction to go in the forward direction, you would add reactant, which would make these numbers bigger, then QC would be smaller, and it would go towards products. And how would you make the reaction go in the reverse? Ah, so the question, how do you make a reaction go in reverse? Would, and the answer is you would add products. And so you can imagine here that since we're not at equilibrium, and since we have to do the reverse reaction, somebody might have added product to get the reaction to go back. And we will see examples where we do that. It's counterintuitive to add products to a reaction at equilibrium, but there will be times we want to do it. So Marissa, first, uh, what if it's already at equilibrium? Done. If we're not at equilibrium, we're figuring out how to get there. Anna and then Travis. Oh, I, I guess I was just going to ask then. Um, actually, no, I don't, I don't know what I was going to ask. I think I'm just confused with that because um, like, if we were to do that in lab, are we doing that in lab? Adding products? At, where you, you add an already made product, and then you just you observe that the um, reaction goes in reverse. Then, reaction goes in reverse, so then when the reaction goes in, in reverse, it will then uh, reach, well, 
will it make more uh, reactive, or will it just kind of reach a new equilibrium? All, so if we were to actually calculate for this, we could calculate how this reaction goes from being, how it goes in reverse and finds a new equilibrium. And what's brilliant is that when we do the lab, it is called Le Chatelet's principle, when we add products, we have chosen reactions that visually indicate when you shift back towards reactants. And I will say this, the Le Chatelet's principle lab is, all, is usually students' favorite one because it's so visual, it's so appealing, and it makes a lot of sense when you do it. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Travis and then Mackenzie. Oh, just in course of adding more products to shift the other way, can yep. you also take out reactants? Can you also take out reactants? Yes, and we will do that too. Oh. So in terms of adding product to product, so it shifts the other way, are the two products colliding together to make the reactants spin? Ah, so uh, if we were to add a product, which I think it looks like we did because we're uh, past the equilibrium point. We're heading in the reverse direction. Well, there's only one reactant here. If we wanted to know how this reverse reaction actually occurred, we would study its kinetics. And, uh, and so we don't know, right? Because overall reactions, they just tell us what the stoichiometry is. And now it's going to tell us what the equilibrium constant is but that never tells us how it happens. The only way to tell, and why kinetics are so important, the only way to tell how a reaction happens, whether it's in organic chemistry, whether it's the metabolism of a drug, is to look at its concentration over time, or do multiple experiments with different initial concentrations, and see how that rate changes. Right, other than that, because that is it, like, Nothing we will do the rest of the semester says how the reactions happen with the actual collisions. We are back in the land where we do not speak of time. From now on, time is what turns kittens into cats. And that's it. <laughs> anyway, but it's a good question. We just don't have it. Like, we have to go back to kinetics. We have to set up the experiments. Um, and... And that's, that is probably, well, you'll use, you use some equilibrium constants, but you use a lot of kinetics when you get to OCHEM as well. Because OCHEM, OCHEM is all about how reactions happen. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, so now we know KC, approximately what it means. We know uh, QC. Now let's start solving problems. And we'll be solving for the concentrations at equilibrium. And we'll be using what's called an ice table. <clears throat> and there are two types of problems. And we're starting with the one that is less than 10%, maybe less than 5%, in which you are given equilibrium concentrations and you solve for Kc. Example, for the reaction given there, the initial concentrations uh, oh, uh, of uh, nitrogen and hydrogen are 0 0.500 molar and 0 0.800 molar respectively. The equilibrium concentration of NH3 is 0 0.150 molar. What is Kc? Let me show you what an ice table is. I will try anyway. An ice table has I, C, E in separate rows down one column. I stands for initial. Concentration. C stands for change in concentration. And E stands for equilibrium concentration. So, 
In this top row here, we will put the reaction, starting in this corner right here, N2 gas. The reaction goes on top, and um, you'll see a lot of people talking about ice tables. Uh, I always put the units of my ice table up here. You'll notice that everything is in molarity so far. That's oftentimes what it is. I'm going to put M up here. I'm going to call it a mice table occasionally, but more generally just an ice table. And uh, for now what we're going to do is we're going to put in our initial concentrations of N2 and H2. We have 0 0.500. 0 0. And this may or may not help right now, but I will tell you, you always put in those concentrations exactly as given. We have no information about the initial concentration of product. That is usually true because you don't start with any product. I'm going to put a zero there with a little asterisk. And the asterisk is going to say, you may assume that the concentration of products is zero unless told otherwise. Right? We don't always have to tell you that is what I'm saying. You may assume. the concentration of products equals zero unless told otherwise. And we will see examples where we are told the concentrations and we will have to put numbers in there. So this is the setup. Now let's talk change in concentration. For change in concentration, that's where coefficients matter. So, for example, we are told that the equilibrium concentration of ammonia is 0 0.150. And so the change in concentration of ammonia must have been 0 0.150. Because initial plus change equals final. Now, this has a 2 coefficient. If we made 0 0.150 mole or ammonia, how much of our nitrogen must we have reacted away? Half of that. Thank you. So, for this time, we'll put half there, just so you know that 1 and 2 are the coefficients. Now, reactants disappear. We need a minus sign there as well, because of course we're going to have less reactants. Now we can do a minus 3 halves to 0 0.150 here, because there's a 3 to 2 ratio. Oh, sorry. I wrote the wrong number here, didn't I? Yeah. It should be 0 0.150. That's cheating, I know, but that says 0 0.150 in parentheses minus one half in front of it. Under the hydrogen, minus three halves times that concentration, and those numbers are the coefficients. Now I'll put my final answers down here. Do the subtraction, you get 0 0.425 and 0 0.575 for the hydrogen.
We've been asked to determine what is Kc. We have equilibrium values for the concentrations. Now we will make the Kc expression concentration of ammonia squared over our reactants. Concentration of ammonia squared over nitrogen concentration times hydrogen cubed. And now that we have values for those concentrations, we will just plug them in and chug towards our number answer. The number you get, or you should get, or the number I got, 0 0.278 as our KC value. Question? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, wait a minute, hydrogen, three, coefficient is three, cubing it. Oh, cubing it. And the products are squared. Thank you. Don't worry about carrying units to the KC number. Good question. Do we worry about carrying units to the KC number? The short answer is, and I'm sorry to say this, no. KCs don't have units. Equilibrium constants don't have units. The longer answer you learn in a class called physical chemistry your junior years. And I'm happy to talk about it in office hours, but um, th there's a way that they can cancel out the units and everything works very nicely. But no, they don't have units, and you do not need to report them with units. You will never see them. You will almost never see them with units. Any other questions? Problem type two, given Kc, solve for equilibrium concentrations. Here we have, uh, and this is the greater than 90% of problems. As we embark on doing nine of them throughout the rest of this lecture and the next lecture, and you will see that I, I don't even think, this one may not be on your new homework. There's at least five of these on your new homework, so you will get lots of practice with this. All right, so this time we're given Kc. Um, we're given an initial concentration. We're asked to calculate the equilibrium concentrations of all species. This is going to be an ice table problem. I will just write ice now for initial change and equilibrium concentration. They're all in molarities, so M goes there. And I typically write my KC value at the end just to keep myself organized and to know that I already know. Here we've got an initial concentration of phosphorus pentachloride, PCL5, of 5.00 molar. I guess I don't have to write the units in because they're already here. And I've got no information about my products, so we will assume they're zero. Always a good assumption unless told otherwise. Now, we don't know how much. Well, let's say this. So this value of 85, what do we know about the reaction? Is it gonna go all the way? Is it gonna go nowhere? Is it gonna get stuck in the middle? No. It's gonna get stuck in the middle. So we have an idea about what our answers are gonna be. So if our math doesn't work out, then we get 99.9999999% products or reactants, redo the math. All right. 
We don't know how much, but some of the reactant reacts away. And we do know that whatever reacts away here has to show up on the other side as each of the products. And that's what we're going to find is X. X is called the extent of reaction. Another word would be the amount of reaction. X is called the extent of reaction, the amount of reaction, and whatever is taken away on one side has to be created on the other side. All right, now we're going to do math. We're going to be left with answers in terms of uh, X's. And now we're going to solve for X, because we're going to have an equation. It looks like this. We know KC. We can write the KC expression. We write it out in terms of concentrations and since we have expressions for the equilibrium concentrations, we can plug them into the equilibrium constant. So all I did was PCL3 at equilibrium was X. Bingo. Got another one right there. 5 minus X goes into the denominator. And we were given the KC value, so now we have one equation, one unknown. Speaking of plug and chuck. Do the algebra solve for X. Good, I have more space to work. I was worried. Do you like algebra? I don't know. Well, we'll see, because you're going to get to do a lot of it. All right. So here we are. I'm just going to call this top x squared. Uh, I'm going to drop all the zeros. It's just 5 minus x. Bring this up to the, so the side over here. We get x squared equals 5 times 85, which is 425, minus 85x. Um, Get everything onto the same side, and what are we going to do now to your and my delight? We're going to factor it. Factoring it is a good idea. I'm going to set up the quadratic equation. <laughs> if you can factor it, though, great. Quadratic equation goes, well, A equals 1, B equals minus 425. C equals minus, uh, what's that? Oh, yes. Thank you, Lois. Oh, well. Plus 85x minus 425. That, was that the signs that they had before? Yeah. Oh, good. Now, B equals 85. C equals minus 425. And the whole thing equals zero. There we go. My apologies for that. Okay. The quadratic equation. Uh, 
negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over the whole thing over 2a. There are two roots. One of them will be positive. That is the positive answer there. x equals 4.74 molar. I will allow you to practice your algebra and get that answer in the privacy of your own home. We're not done now because that's only solving for x. It's true that x equals the equilibrium concentration of each of the products. We will state that explicitly. And phosphorus pentachloride will be 5 minus 4.74. done my math correct, 0.26 more. We are not surprised, although we're not 100% sure about this, the K value slightly bigger than 185. We do have some more products than reactants, 4.74 for 0 to 0 0.26. That checks out at least. Any questions? Okay. Eighty five is in the middle because uh, eighty five means that there will be significant amounts of reactants and products. I call, would call this and this significant amounts. Insignificant amounts would be something like zero point zero 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 one molarity. Large. Well, um, if KC, if KC was a million, we might see this as 4.99999, right? Because it can never truly get to five. Five would be the reaction is complete 100%. To get a complete 100% reaction, your equilibrium constant has to be infinity, which it never is. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I would assume 85 is large. Yeah, you would assume 85 is large. I would say, I, I don't know. Certainly we have more products than reactants. Wait till you solve an equilibrium constant expression for an ice table problem just like this. Quite a problem, by the way. Two pages, one problem. Fun. But what will happen is, just like limiting reactant problems last semester, just so you'll do 50 of these and you'll get a, a, a sense of what each of the product, what, what is large KC? When do coefficients matter? When don't they matter? Right? And by the time we get to the end of this chapter and you get the next chapter, which all the coefficients are one, you will say like a silent thank you to whoever you thank, and it, because you'll be like, now I don't have to worry about coefficients other than one. Anyway, we, we, it's a great question. We're developing our understanding of this KC thing. And it turns out KC at 85 is in the middle. KC greater than 10,000 is almost all products and almost no reactions. Travis? In response to the algebra, um, obviously the number has to be between 0 and 5. So if doing that and we get to plus or minus, we get two different values that would both be within that range, how would you go about the problem? Great question. You solve it um, and you get 4.74 and 2.16. Never happens. Never happens? Never happens. Sweet. I can't think of a single case where it happens. Let's not say it never happens. Right? So, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and if you solve this for the other root, it'll be minus here and a minus there. Yeah, so of course it'll be negative for this one. Um, but and I, so I can't think of a single case where you get the two roots both being physically possible. 
Mackenzie? So a concentration of four versus zero point two six, that's still considered like that's still so 4.74 molar versus 0.26 molar, that's still considered in the middle. 0.26 still a significant concentration. We use those concentrations all the time in lab. Right, so we're getting a feeling for what is significance. And anything with, uh, and sometimes even things with four or five, like 0 0.00001, most of the time that will be insignificant, but sometimes that will matter too especially when we talk about pHs. Any other questions? Now, I don't know about you. Do you love solving this quadratic equation? I don't. I look for shortcuts around it. Let's see if we can find some shortcuts. Let's go to the next page. And this will be our first way of not doing the... Uh, solving the quadratic. And while I'm erasing, I will point out that you can always solve the quadratic if you personally love solving a quadratic and you won't have programmable calculators on the exam. So if you have to solve the quadratic, you will do it longhand. Part of the reason that we don't allow. Um, but um, you can always do it and it always works. This is called the small k. Assume that you can ignore x, then check assumption, approximation. And here we have, for the Hopper process at a given temperature, kc equals 1.1 times 10 to the minus third. Hmm, this should be interesting. Let's see. Um, we have initial concentrations. What are the concentrations at equilibrium? This is just like the problem we just did. We'll set up an ice table. Ice tables all look the same. We'll do 50 to 100 of them. We have initial concentrations of nitrogen and hydrogen. We may assume that we have no ammonia at the start. And Kc. OK. Now, um, here's how this goes. Uh, and I'll make a note of it this time. C stands for change. And I just thought of this. I don't know if this works for you. But the coefficients, which also starts with C, always show up in the change part because that's how, when the reaction is done. So for C, coefficients always show up in the change area. Always appear. Here. What does that mean? We have a 1 here, so that just means minus x. We have a 3 here, minus 3x. We have a 2, well, and this is an easy mistake to make. You got to have minuses on one side of the arrow because that's reacting away. You got to have pluses on the other side. We saw an example before where the reaction was going in reverse. It is possible to have the minuses over here and the pluses over there, but there'd still be two pluses and a minus. All right. Well, uh, the math, this math, not too bad. So far. Uh, I'm going to try and squeeze. Let's try and squeeze all my other mana. Looks the same. And let's do a little bit more on this page. We write out our KC expression. It's going to be products raised to coefficients over reactants. Good. Now, the 
bit about process. You'll notice that I am, if not neat, I won't say neat, but I am fairly meticulous about my setup on these. I always write out a complete ice table. I always write out my KC expression because when I write it out, I remember to put in the exponents. I'm not, you don't have to, but this is another one of those things where you have to develop your process to always get the right answer, whatever that is. And I've seen a lot of students skip writing this concentration expression out, and then they forget, right, they're in a rush. So whatever your process is, right, smooth as silk. It's like shooting free throws. Do it a million times, do it the same way, then you step up to the line, make your shots. All right. All right, so I got my 2x, which is my equilibrium concentration. I got it squared. It is the whole quantity 2x that is squared. So this is really 4x squared when I multiply it out. I think that's right. I didn't check my notes. Let's hope. So good. Thank you. Also part of my process, so thank you, Ms. Rosa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, now now it's one equation, one unknown. We have all we have to do is solve it. Now, a um, couple things I'll point out to is what's the power of x in this denominator? <laughs> Is that x to the fourth power? Do you know how to solve an x to the fourth power equation? If you do, tell me, because I don't. <laughs> Certainly not on an exam. And so this is an example where we will need to make an approximation in order to solve it at all. This is the small x, assume, uh, small k, assume that you can ignore x, then check assumption. Here's what that looks like. We are going to assume that x is much less than 0 0.010. So that 0 0.010 minus x equals 0 0.010. So we're ignoring x. And we'll go back over here. Ignore x. And we'll do the same thing for the other one. I don't know. I'm not a math person. I'm tempted to write ignore x, but I can also see why you'd want to write ignore 3x as well. Whatever x is whether it's by itself or multiplied times three, it will be small. Ignore x again. So assume that x is much smaller than this number. Assume that 3x So the same thing, we just want to ignore the x's. That means that we don't have, well, we still have a fourth order power, but we all those x and 3x and x cubed terms have now gone away. And so now we get 2x, still quantity squared, over 0 0.010. times 0 0.020 cubed. And that is still equal to 1.1 times 10 to the minus 3. Do you feel better about solving that than you do that? I know I do. All you got to do, these are just numbers. Multiply them up to get them up here. Cross multiply or however you do it. 
and x is 4.7 times 10 to the minus 6. Molarity. Put the units back in. Now we have to actually calculate all of our equilibrium concentrations. Concentration of ammonia is two times that number. Fill in everything, now we get, well, if I do this subtraction, I actually get 0 0.009995 molarity. Which is approximately equal to 0 0.010, certainly to the number of sig figs we have in this problem. And hydrogen. And those are malaria. So our assumption was a good assumption. We'll talk more about that assumption in the last few minutes. Any questions about what I've got up there so far? Yeah, promise. Uh, would there be a time where the x we found contradicts our assumption? Like the x we found would be like greater than 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 as we found? Good question. So would x ever be bigger than this? <laughs> The short answer is no, and so if mathematically, and I don't know if you can see that, it took me like three times to get the math right myself, but each time I knew that it was either too big or too small based on, so if I get one where x is bigger than this number, it, the math cannot work out that way. So if it does, redo it, and I, that I happens to me all the time. In fact, the way to tell, and this is great, I love this, that you have the right answer is whatever concentrations you actually get, plug them back in and see if you get KC. Self-checking problem. Right? Um, but no, it shouldn't happen. Now, if you do the math wrong, oftentimes you still get an answer that could be correct. If you got 0 0.001, you might think it's correct even though it's not. So, anyway, does that answer your question? Yeah. You should, you have to get answers that make physical sense. And the math is complicated, although we saved ourselves and actually made this solvable by making an assumption. But now let me talk about how to check the assumption. It says then check the assumption. If x and 3x are each less than 5% of their respective concentrations, the assumption is good. So, check assumption. If x is less than 5% of what it's subtracted from, and 3x then the assumption is good. If your assumption is not good, 
do the math explicitly. And you couldn't have done this math explicitly, so the assumption better be good. But if not good, do the math explicitly. Right. Don't make this assumption. S multiply everything else. And you will run into cases where you do have to solve ugly, ugly quadratics. That only quadratics, though. Nothing with a third power, x cubed, or a fourth power. So, and what's interesting is my typical rule of thumb is that if Kc is... Oh, no, less than 10 to the minus 4th. That's why I gave you those numbers. You can make this assumption. However, due to the exponents in this problem, 10 to the minus 3 works. Right? So if Kc is less than, I guess less than is this way now I think about it. If Kc is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4th, this assumption will be good. Although you should always check it, less than 5%. And I think, I, did I write down the numbers for this? I think it was 0.071%. So it was much smaller than 5%. Any other questions about this? Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I will take questions, but it is after 1.50. I know people have lab. Uh, we'll stop there, and I'll take questions. Logan.